Welcome to today's SANS webcast, the five-day blueprint for the supercharged SOC, Management 551, Building and Leading Security Operations has expanded. With us today, we have John Hubbard and Mark Orlando, who are the authors and instructors for Management 551. This webcast will be recorded and available uh, for viewing and downloading the slides through your SANS portal account in about 24 hours. During the presentation, if you have any questions for the presenters, please post them in the Q&A and we will address them at the end. Thank you very much. John and Mark, take it away. All right, thank you, Laura. Very, very excited to be doing this presentation for you today because we are bringing to you an extension to a very exciting course, Management 551, uh, which is our Building and Leading Security Operations Center course. Real quick, uh, some bios. Myself, uh, my name is John Hubbard. Um, I am a certified instructor here at SANS uh, slash kind of SOC consultant on the side. I've been working in security operations for many, many years. Uh, previously worked in large organizations, kind of became involved with SANS and, and wrote a few courses along the way, one of them being SEC 455, the other one being SEC 450, uh, Blue Team Fundamentals, Security Operations and Analysis, which is kind of the technical uh, course that pairs well with this one. Um, but we are here today to talk about 551, right? Uh, this is a course that covers a whole bunch of uh, blue team management topics. And so with that, uh, I will let Mark do an introduction for himself real quick, and then <clears throat> we will get the show on the road. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mark Orlando. I am a SANS instructor. In addition to being co-author for this new Management 551 expansion, uh, I also teach SEC 450. Uh, the Blue Team Fundamentals course that John has written. Uh, previously, I have spent uh, about 20 years as a SOC analyst, a SOC manager, SOC consultant um, in both public and private sector. Uh, currently, the co-founder and CEO of Bionic Cyber, which is a cyber defense company. So really excited to be here today with John to uh, share this new version of the course with you. Uh, with that, John, I'll kick it back to you. Thank you. All right, so as I said, um, Management 551 was a course that I had previously authored as a two-day uh, course on, on SOC management, and we had released it last year, right around August or so uh, time frame. but right away we were getting uh, requests from people, we love the content, we love a little bit more, is this ever going to be a five-day course, and it took very little convincing from the community that we were like, yep, we need to expand this course out to a full five days, and so uh, Becoming closer with Mark over the last couple of years, uh, he had become my partner in crime on a lot of things like the other course uh, and just various to uh, topics and, and talks and other things like that. So he was the natural fit. Uh, as you heard, he has an extensive background in this. And between me and him, uh, we were able to craft up a whole bunch of extra material to go into this course. So really um, what we've done is we've taken what was in the course before and just expanded on everything, added some more stuff, added more labs, added a, uh, a CTF that goes around, not CTF, uh, and more of a cyber simulation, Cyber 42, if you're familiar with the SANS management curriculum, uh, that goes on the end of each day. And so a bunch of really exciting stuff. Uh, this course in a nutshell covers the topics we have here. First, we start off with SOC planning and building. Um, Having taught the course over the last year, I know from polling the audience every time we teach it that there's a lot of people who take it that are looking to build a brand new SOC, and that makes a lot of sense, right? The course is exactly designed for that. Uh, and so we talk in extensive detail about some of the considerations that you'll have to think about when building out a SOC. Uh, from there, we get into the applies to everyone, no matter what type of a SOC you're coming in with type uh, content, the daily operations, uh, the considerations for processes you have to be running, how to run those processes, the inputs, the outputs, and all the kind of detail that goes along with that. We cover um, detection and we cover incident response and kind of the whole spectrum from the identify, contain, eradicate, all that kind of stuff along the way, the Pickerel process, if you're familiar with that acronym, which I'm sure this audience largely is. Uh, we also go into some of the meta details about running a SOC. How do we make the SOC run better? How do we prevent burnout? How do we use automation in the smartest way possible? What kind of metrics are the most important? And so we really dive into continuous improvement, right, as a general category. 
uh, really, really big important thing, no matter where you are in a SOC, right? How do you measure where you are and how do you make sure that is always going in the right direction? Uh, from there, we get into analytic testing and how do we make sure not only that we think that things are working, but how do we test? How do we make the plan for that test? What should we test? All of that stuff is kind of wrapped up throughout the days in this course. So. We're doing this presentation bottom line up front style. If you're here to just hear about the first five days, I'm going to rattle through in a little bit more detail how the new course is laid out. And then we're going to dive into some details on all of these topics and a little bit more uh, extensive information about how we cover them and, and some of the information about them. So day one, uh, SOC design and planning. As I said, one of the things we have set out to do with this course is make it very, very clear to anyone that's showing up, regardless of where you are in the SOC building process, how a SOC works with a number of mental models. What are the inputs to the SOC? What are the outputs to the SOC? And then we decompose it into more granular functions. Some of you in this webcast may have taken the two-day version of this course, and you'll be familiar when we go through those in a second, but things like the collection, right? How do we know we're collecting the right stuff? How do we go and figure out what we need to collect? All that kind of stuff. We break it down into very granular pieces, which ultimately helps us facilitate measuring those pieces and understanding, are we doing the right thing or not? So we talk about SOC planning in that respect. We also talk about the people aspect, right? A SOC is people, process, technology. And in our opinion, people is definitely the most important piece. So we go into team creation. What can you do for looking for the for building the best possible team? Some interview tips, interview methods, uh, where you can go to find the right people, how you can make your jobs in specific uh, very um, appealing to anyone that might be joining or uh, looking to join a new security team, all that kind of stuff. We get into the physical space. Uh, I know many of us are in a virtual SOC. We also cover that. Um, but we also, when we probably, many of us at least, go back to a, a physical SOC, how to build that out, the considerations for what you need in the room, what you need at each person's desk, how you might want to set up the network for all the devices in that room, even all the way down to that kind of stuff and how to keep all those things safe from your organizational network as well. Um, core SOC tool set. What are the tools you absolutely must have at least? What are the nice to haves? And what are the like, eh, it's, it's fancy and it can help, but it's not the most important stuff, right? We try to break it down like that. Uh, protecting SOC data and capabilities is a big piece of this. How do we make sure a compromise of your constituency does not become a compromise of the SOC? We have a very, very important series of slides on that. And that's one thing I always like to hit really, really heavily is like, how do we make sure a compromise here is not going to follow itself back up into the SOC and then become the attackers watching you try to respond to them? You can never win in that situation. As I mentioned, uh, when we go through every single day, there are hands-on exercises. You may have taken some management courses that have a little bit more discussion. You may have taken some that are uh, a little more kind of uh, hands-on or uh, theory-based, we kind of have a mix of all of the labs in this class. We will be getting you hands-on with some SOC tools. We're also going to have some more kind of organizational and uh, calculation and, and planning and capacity uh, forecasting type labs and kind of the whole spectrum we tried to cover, make it a really diverse set of hands-on uh, exercises that come throughout the series of five days that actually build on each other as well. Day two is all mindset, preparation, collection, and monitoring type stuff. As I mentioned, we have to consider what is the data that is the most important to gather. No one is going to have infinite budget, right? And so with that lack of infinite budget, we have to prioritize. And one of the big things we also cover is what should your priorities be? I mean, I can't just say like, here is the answer, right? We tell you how to make that decision for yourself because not every team has the same priorities, of course. Depending on the industry that you work in, depending on the size of your organization, those things can differ dramatically. So that's kind of a theme running throughout the course as well. It's not always, here is the answer. It's here's how to decide the right answer for you. Uh, we talk about that in terms of collection, monitoring, and metrics, and many other things. We go into MITRE ATT&CK. Obviously, one of the biggest developments in information security over the last few years has been the continued proliferation of MITRE ATT&CK showing up in our tools and our ways of measuring the SOC. So we talk about how to implement that in the easiest way possible, how to leverage the ATT&CK tool set to translate into those priorities for collection, uh, cyber threat intelligence, and where we can use MITRE ATT&CK to build on it or extract from it. Uh, as a consumer of that threat intelligence, practical collection concerns, how do we make sure the whole thing is just going to work, right? One of the most important things about collection is if you don't do it right, nothing else down the line is going to function correctly, right? So you have to make sure you get that part right. 
After that, we get into day three. We were talking more about the detection piece. And from the data we have collected, how do we turn that into hopefully really, really high fidelity alerts? So we're gonna talk about detection and analytic design. How do we get rid of those false positives? No one likes false positives. They ruin everyone's day. They ruins every, ruin everyone's metrics. So we do some diving on how we can best get rid of those and continuous processes we can run to try to get rid of that stuff. Uh, capacity planning, ways that we can take the data we have and just make it better so that we can better eliminate false positives kind of on the whole in the future. Uh, we also get into some of the more like uh, threat hunting type stuff, analysis frameworks, how we can organize the data we're collecting, different ways that we can approach detection, uh, whether it's active defense or other things like that as well. Uh, we get into the practical concerns too, right? How do we do alerting when maybe you're off hours and, and someone needs to be contacted in the middle of the night? You'll see this as a theme throughout the course. We try to teach the theory, what we need to know to do it right, how do we do it right, and then the practical aspects of like, in the real world, these are the things you're going to need to consider that you might not read if you're just reading a theory textbook on how to detect stuff. There are some practical concerns, obviously, that go with this. Uh, some of those things, exercises show up in this day, use case design, how do we store those use cases? How do we plan threat hunts? How do we schedule them? How do we do some capacity planning and predict how much uh, what the volume of alerts are that we're going to be producing in the SOC and how we can staff uh, for those expectations and how we can measure it to make sure we're continuously kind of staying on top of that. Day four is all about preparation for incident response planning, um, how to build the team, what the capacities of that team need to be and what the services it's going to offer, uh, might, what you might consider for those services, what are the tools you may need to start up an incident response function, whether you even want to have in-house in incident response, right? One of the other things we talk about throughout the courses, is this something you're going to consider outsourcing? Is it going to be something you're going to provide within the SOC? So we cover those things as well. Uh, crisis management, continuous improvement of incident response. Uh, we really, really hit hard the training and preparation aspect for this. It is both Mark and I's firm belief that if you don't practice before it happens for real, you are going to struggle. And so we really put a strong emphasis on making sure you're ready by simulating problems, testing individual analytics, testing your incident response process so that you can be sure that things are going to go well uh, when the real attackers do come knocking. So we talk about incident response with the React framework. We talk about incident quality review so that we can make sure the investigations we're doing over time stay at a high level of quality and you can ensure that up to whatever your standards are. We talk about how to develop those standards. We talk about designing tabletop exercises and planning them and making sure to run them, scheduling and all that sort of good stuff. And beyond that, day five, we get into effective execution. There are a lot of people I talk to, both from the management course and from SEC 450, that talk about burnout and retention issues in a SOC. We've all at least heard of them if we're not experiencing them for themselves or for ourselves. And so one of the things we wanted to hit really strong in here is what does the data show we can do to make the best possible SOC team where people love to come to work, are engaged in the work, are doing the work they should be doing instead of the work that maybe could be handed off to automation and just create this virtuous cycle of goodness happening in the SOC, right? So we talk about um, burnout mitigation, we talk about metrics and goals and effective execution and how to balance daily operations and the projects you're trying to get done through uh, all of the pressure to also consistently improve all that stuff. A problem that nearly every SOC has is we're fighting this whirlwind of, of firefighting daily activity and we never feel like we have in time to do the real improvements that remove work from the future. And so we make a big deal about like, here is what you can do to help balance making automation uh, to improve stuff uh, in the future going forward, how we can decide what's gonna be the best uh, kind of way to balance that given your staffing levels and things like that. Continuous improvement is really the, the whole idea of this one. And we have labs that go with this as well. Training and career development planning uh, to help people get in the right direction. Everyone likes growth in the SOC. And so we wanna ensure that sort of thing is happening. The SOC metrics that can help you measure both execution and your initiatives. And then at the end of the course, we have a purple team assessment lab where you're not doing one, but you're learning how you can plan one with some awesome free software I have used many times in the real world for real purple teams. Uh, we show it to you, show you how to use it and say, here is all the stuff you took earlier in the class. Let's load it into that purple team software. Now you got your plan to test everything that you develop that we talk about throughout this course. So uh, 
back to some of the deeper stuff that we, we cover through all of this. For those who are creating their first SOC, some of the things we want to talk about in this section, documents and policies, right? What's going to be good to have laid out from the start? How are you going to design your SOC both in the physical sense or in the virtual sense? Having pulled people since COVID started, I know there's a lot of SOC teams that were like, well, we were in a physical room and now actually it seems like it works pretty well with everyone working from home. So we're going to look to do that. So a lot of teams have started to develop virtual infrastructure that might have had a physical counterpart had that not happened. And so we have some uh, direction on how you can build, you know, AWS based kind of infrastructure for supporting a SOC and things like that. How you monitor uh, what you need to monitor, hiring and org structures, daily operations considerations, uh, daily ops, handoff meeting, shift change type stuff, and then strategies for building that up over time. That's going to be a lot of people coming to the course. The other half, or, or maybe maybe less than half, are the folks that have an already mature SOC uh, that are just looking for continued tips. And we got tons and tons of that as well, as we said, over the, the five days. Um, we are going to go in specifically into network security monitoring, endpoint monitoring, cloud monitoring. Not so much the technical aspects of it, although we will mention along the way, like these are some of the data sources you definitely need to have and help you figure out what those things are for you. Um, but the importance of making sure they're working right, which ones are going to be key. We don't get down into like event IDs and all that kind of stuff, uh, super specific, but um, setting up collection so that you know that it's going to work and provide that base foundation of like, we can see the attacks. Step one is make the data available. Step two is then pick out the actual unique stuff in that data. So this is all kind of towards that. From there, we talk about software integration, how to make sure all your tools are playing well together, automation, when to use it, how to use it, how to identify the best opportunities for automation and ways to think about that, and just the general kind of continuous improvement stuff that, that comes along with all of that. One of the ways we also approach this is how do you consider, wh where do you consider your SOC to be right now on a maturity level? And wherever you are, how can we help you get to that next step? Now, this slide here uh, has the results of a security operations survey from Microfocus, where they, they do a state of security operations survey every year. And from the most recent one, um, they went out and they surveyed hundreds of, of SOCs a year, and they find that most SOCs fall somewhere in the level one to two range. And then they say the ideal range is actually not five, but three to four. Uh, depending on the situation that you are working in, whether you're an MSSP, whether you're a large enterprise SOC, a smaller enterprise SOC, there are some different goals that you might want to set and different considerations you may need to prioritize. And so this is one of the ways we look at this and say, if this is the situation we're in, uh, you are in, this is how you might move toward those more important things you need to prioritize. And so as you can see here, nearly every single category here is typically about one and a half for the average SOC. We want to get everyone up in the three or four range. And we talk about level five and a little bit why that's bad. Um, or maybe not bad, but uh, not worth it in terms of the cost. Uh, there's a little bit of too much complexity that can be introduced there. So goals for this class, move everyone towards a level three and four maturity. We are looking for reliable detection. We're looking for sustainable work environment. We are looking for a continuously improving team. Uh, and we're looking to leverage some of the modern tools to do that, such as automation and SOAR platforms, cloud monitoring, right? The whole kind of everything that goes with that. We look at it with a, with a modern eye and say, here are the tools you need to have now to achieve up to level three and four status, or at least begin moving down that path, right? Now, one of the things that we'll dive into a little bit in this webcast, and we hit really hard in the class, is, is a conceptualization for breaking down all of the stuff that a SOC has to do. When I think about what a SOC really is, you can take the like, we need to remediate and minimize the attacks that we see for our organization and try to basically uh, stop any high impact cyber attacks, if nothing else, right? The pieces that that breaks down into is data collection, detection of stuff within that collected data, triage and investigation, and then the incident response function. And those are what I'm calling the five core SOC activities here. Uh, but there are some other things that go with this as well. And sometimes these are part of the SOC, sometimes these are not part of the SOC. That would be threat intelligence, forensics capacities, uh, red teams, penetration testing, vulnerability assessment, uh, patching, and all the stuff that goes with that as well. And so when we start to break down the, the um, details of all these items throughout the course, that's how we step through it. 
we make this diagram here and, and kind of draw out uh, how we picture the sock. And that is, what is the input? What is the output? How can we make the input better? How can we measure the input and the output to make sure everything is working functionally? And then how do we break all those pieces down into smaller and smaller and smaller bits and then more granularly measure just everything throughout the entire way? So the collection events, right? On the left side there, that's kind of the input to the SOC. Can we even see what's happening? Are we doing the detection piece correct? Are we doing the triage and investigation for all the things that pile up that might be bad that hopefully are very, very accurate? How do we give analysts the context they need in an automatic way that is consistently there so they can look at a pile of, let's say, 20 different alerts that might have gone off at once and immediately say, like, with no pause, that's the one I need to do right now because it's the most dangerous. We always compare this to an emergency room, right? There's a whole bunch of people coming in with very, very different levels of severity conditions. And the person at the front desk or whoever uh, in an emergency room needs to know who goes first. And in a SOC, it's the same thing. So we talk about approaching that kind of problem and how we can solve that in the easiest way possible. The investigation stage, how do we know that people are doing high quality investigations to the standard that we expect? We have a whole lab on this, setting what the standard should be, building out a template for what that standard should be, and then checking and making sure you check enough times within whatever period you want to check to actually have a representative and good kind of feeling that what you have seen does indicate that your SOC is doing generally blanket high quality analysis and not falling into you know cognitive bias traps and, and all the sorts of other uh, things that maybe are easy to slip into if you haven't ever looked for it before. And then incident response, of course, as well. Now that's kind of the core of the SOC, right? Collection, detection, triage, investigation, incident response. But we also talk about where does threat intelligence come in? What should you expect from your threat intelligence team? Mark wrote a whole awesome lab about this, uh, how to write requirements, what to expect from your threat intelligence team, how to integrate that data into your workflow. We talk about self-assessment, um, working with penetration testing teams, scheduling, and some of the other kind of stuff that you might expect for testing your SOC and forensics as well. We touch on how it can support your investigations and your incident response. We also have a big focus kind of on the external factors, like who are our attackers? If we're trying to do a really good job with security, one of the basic things you have to know to prioritize effectively is like, what's out there? What are they going to try to do to me? And so if you know your attackers, you have taken one major step towards taking your defense and customizing it towards what those attackers will probably do. And so while this is not a threat intelligence course, we do expect that everyone working in a SOC is going to be at least a consumer of threat intelligence, if not a producer in some respects as well. So we do put a lot of focus on like, let's look at the groups that are out there, right? Let's look at actual threat groups. Let's go out, we search them, we figure out what we have that's of value. And then we kind of look outside and we say, all right, who wants that sort of thing? Where is there evidence of an attack that that's happening right now? And then we take those threat groups that we find and we say, what are the tactics they're gonna potentially use to get those things from us? And we may see supply chain attacks, ransomware, business email compromise. I have those bolded because those are the three most common ones we often see people asking about right now, especially in light of solar winds and all the human operated ransomware campaigns that are going on. But like beyond that, right? There's a whole bunch of different tactics. And so we want to facilitate you, especially if you're coming in looking to build a brand new SOC, looking out into the environment saying, who's out there? What are they going to do to me? How can I protect against that? And how can I catch those attacks? And so we go into those things, which are obviously super important to have. Uh, team creation hiring. Like I said, we talk about org charts. We talk about tiers, uh, tiered versus tierless socks. Uh, hiring in terms of recruitment, where to look, how to make sure your jobs uh, postings get out everywhere they need to be for interviewing, what to look for, how to take the bias, uh, un unconscious bias that just creeps into interviews sometimes, processes that will remove that that are scientifically proven to give you the best results. Training, how do you develop training plans, certifications, and some of the stuff that can go with that for building up the people that are working uh, in your SOC as well. Once we have the SOC planned and all the stuff in there, it is time to build. So like I said, we're going to cover uh, physical space considerations. We're going to talk desk layout. We're going to talk space planning. We're going to talk work area specifics. I even get down, at least when I teach the course, I even get down to ranting about giving people like monitors and keyboards and chairs and mice, like things that will enhance productivity and make people just generally happy. And whether that's giving people stipends to do it in their home office or whether it's at work. 
these have real ramifications, right? If people are uncomfortable all day, <laughs> how productive do you think they're going to be? Virtual and remote SOC onboarding. What are we going to do if you have never physically met someone, you can't sit there at their desk with them and walk them through some of the processes? What are the challenges you're going to face building a virtual team? How are you going to manage a virtual team? How are you going to make sure a virtual team is collaborating? We've done some of the research on that, especially what's come out over the last year and looked at some of the challenges and weaved in some of the best practice for that sort of thing as well. And then from there, we get into SOC tools and technology, which is going to be that conversation of what is at least expected to put up a modern defense? What do you need to have to catch lateral movement? What do you need to have to catch unexpected executables running in your environment? What are the old tools and how do you use them in a modern way? Because a lot of the stuff we've had for years will catch a modern attack. We just have to make sure we're actually collecting it and doing the right stuff with it. So we talk about what that is. And then the next gen SOC capabilities, we get into XDR and UV, UEBA and all those kind of like new acronyms that have shown up over the last few years, as well as the SOC supporting tools like the SIM, threat intelligence platforms, incident management systems, how they should all connect together, how they should integrate and how all of that stuff needs to be combined with more data management tools for the SOC, like use case databases and SOC knowledge bases, software repos, playbooks, and how to build up that stuff and store it and keep it up to date. <laughs> how to best build it, how to best keep it up to date. All those kind of important things. From there, we get into daily operations, which I'm going to pass it over to Mark to continue on from here and take on this topic. Okay, thanks, John. Um, so as John mentioned, you know, what we've tried to do with this course uh, is kind of bring all of our operational experience, all of our lessons learned, uh, some of the things that we started or John started with the two-day version of the course and really expanded out. Uh, fortunately, the new five-day format gives us the time uh, to really dive into some of this stuff. And one of the lessons learned that I think we've brought in from operating and working in SOCs out in the world is a SOC is so much more than just slamming in a bunch of tools and creating some processes, hiring some people, and you know hope everything just kind of comes together uh, the way it should. So um, more specifically, one of the uh, challenges that I've seen is that teams sometimes mistake operating the tools for really doing analysis, for really doing investigation, right? For bringing value to the organization. So uh, when we talk about daily operations in this new five-day version of the course, we're gonna be talking about things like investigative theory and mindset. What does it mean to be an analyst? Um, how do we prioritize the work that we're doing or the alerts that we want to look at, right? decide where to spend our time and what's most important? John spent some time describing how we've broken the SOC down into a system that has specific inputs, specific components and functions, and specific outputs. So we're gonna dive into that in more detail and uh, discuss what that looks like on a daily operational basis. Uh, we'll talk about the kinds of data that you have to collect, right? detection tools and processes, um, mindsets, mental models for triage and investigation to make sure that we're addressing the most damaging attacks, the biggest threats to our organization first, that we're scoping those and responding to them with speed and accuracy. And we're gonna spend an entire day talking about the incident response process. Uh, now, John and I talked about incident response quite a bit when we were planning out how we were going to expand 551. And I think every organization is a little bit different. Sometimes the SOC is wholly responsible for incident response. Sometimes the SOC is not responsible for incident response. There's an other entire group right, or third-party provider that handles that part of it. But wherever your organization falls on that incident response capability spectrum, being in the SOC or leading the SOC means you have to understand you know, what to do. What are the next steps when you identify that intrusion, that compromise, that suspicious activity? What are you going to recommend to other teams that they do or other partners? So getting that really solid understanding not only of technical incident response, but also of the processes and the mindset and the approaches uh, that underpin uh, that technical response. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about that as well. There we go. 
Uh, we're also going to talk about um, other monitoring, uh, excuse me, we're going to talk about data collection. We'll get to the other monitoring use cases in a minute. Um, John mentioned that if you don't have solid inputs, if you don't have quality signal, right, quality telemetry, you're not going to get good results in the SOC. And most of us that have spent any time in security operations understand that by now. Uh, but we really spend a lot of time digging into uh, specific goals of collection, different tools that you're going to use or that you can use with specific examples of some of the uh, more popular, more effective free tools that John and I really enjoy using uh, that are kind of proven to collect some of this type of uh, telemetry. We're going to talk about some of the newer network protocols that are out there that are privacy focused that can create challenges for us as defenders in terms of getting that visibility, how we can account for that. We're also gonna talk about data collection in the cloud. So as many of our organizations undergo digital transformation or have recently undergone digital transformation, we don't want to sacrifice visibility and security, uh, right, to gain some of those more advanced uh, capabilities from an infrastructure perspective. Right? So we'll talk about how we can maintain that visibility how we can maintain uh, all of our capabilities in the SOC, even in light of that type of digital transformation that may be happening uh, in our environments. One of the newer topics in the new five-day version that I'm really excited about is we've been able to expand uh, our conversation about monitoring to other um, kind of unique use cases for security monitoring. Things that many of us run into on a daily basis in the SOC um, but don't really align to um, kind of more traditional security monitoring. Maybe don't exactly fit into that network security monitoring bucket or that host security monitoring bucket, right? Things like uh, DevOps, right? application development, supply chain considerations, supply chain processes, third-party providers, uh, business email compromise, insider threat. These are things that might incorporate different elements of some of those more traditional monitoring approaches like network security monitoring or host security monitoring, but they're kind of unique in and of themselves. So we've tried to uh, take some time to talk about those unique monitoring scenarios, the kind of telemetry uh, you want to get that can help you maintain good visibility there, but also how to get security you know, injected early and often into some of these processes, how to work with the teams that support some of these processes to maintain uh, good visibility, the ability to identify and respond to incidents. We also talk quite a bit about frameworks and mental models. One of your best friends as a security leader is a framework or a model or a process that you can refer to to avoid having to reinvent something from the ground up. Uh, there's nothing worse than spending a lot of time you know, building something from scratch and then you leave and it kind of falls into disrepair or maybe others in the organization don't quite follow what you're doing because it's coming out of your brain. Fortunately, we have a number of different industry frameworks and reference models like MITRE's attack matrix that we can use to guide some of our planning. And so one of the areas where we use that kind of reference is in data source planning. When I first started working in the SOC, our approach was we want everything. We want all the data in the environment. And as most of you on this uh, webcast realize, that's not exactly the most realistic goal these days with just the sheer amount of data that most of our organizations produce on a daily basis. So uh, in this class, we use MITRE's attack matrix to identify data sources, uh, prioritize them, um, and we do that from the perspective of some of the threat modeling that John described in the earlier days of the course. So what are the threats that are out there? How are they likely to target us? What are they likely to be after? What are the tactics and techniques that they use or may use or have used to target us? Right? And we can express those TTPs uh, in terms of MITRE attack. We can use that as a reference model to kind of guide our thinking around those, guide that cataloging of those TTPs. And then we can map those to our data sources. And one of the things that I really loved about John's two-day version of this course, and that we've carried over into the five-day version, is the labs that we do, right? We've got a lab on 
understanding the threat. And then we carry that over into mapping out, you know, attack trees and visualizing and uh, anticipating how they're going to get into our environment or how they might try to get into our environment. Uh, and we map that all the way to the data sources. So you can draw a through line, not only in the content of the course, but also in uh, the hands-on exercises that we're all going to do from the threats that we're concerned about at a very high level down to very tactical data source planning. And it's a really cool set of labs um, with some great tools and some great reference frameworks that you can take back to your organization and use in that planning. So I'm really excited about that, that element of the course. When we talk about inputs, John also mentioned threat intelligence, that we spend some time digging into what it means to consume threat intelligence, what it means to produce threat intelligence if your team uh, has the opportunity to do that. Uh, helpfully, we've included a picture, uh, most likely of, of what most uh, Intel teams look like. Obviously, they're uh, perpetually cloaked in shadow, uh, most likely wearing fedoras. Um, kidding, of course. Uh, but the bottom line here is that CTI informs many different functions in the SOC. And whether you're at a relatively low maturity level from a threat intelligence perspective or a very high uh, maturity level, we're gonna talk about what it means to produce Intel, how to consume it, uh, some additional reference frameworks, mental models to guide those functions and how we can put threat intelligence to use in the SOC from a very practical perspective, not high level talking about cool things that may or may not be happening out there, but how do these things impact us? How are we looking for these things? What do we do uh, when we find them? What does that process look like? Now, John also mentioned that many of these disciplines and functions that we go over in this class, um, obviously it's a leadership course, right? So we're talking about building, managing, supervising, improving many of these functions. But as a manager uh, of an operations capability, we also have to be aware of some of the very practical challenges that are gonna face us in trying to instrument a network, trying to get the data that we need. So we spent some time talking about uh, the collection function, right? how we can choose, prioritize data sources, some of the different options that we have in uh, processing that data, getting it into a usable format, you know, how best to view and utilize that data, make sure it's consistently high quality. Right? All too often, SOCs take this uh, checkbox approach to data collection. Right? We have that data source check, let's move on and never revisit that again. But we have to uh, constantly manage this collection function, constantly improve it, just as we would any other SOC function. Uh, we spend a good amount of time talking about that in class. Now we move on to triage and investigation. So we understand the inputs to our SOC system. We understand the data that we want to collect, how we're going to get that data into our monitoring and response processes. Right? So now we're going to talk about triage and investigation. How do you prioritize the most damaging and concerning items first and make sure that those get the attention quickly, that you're accurately, completely scoping that activity uh, in order to uh, determine an effective response, right? We're talking about speed, accuracy, contextual information, right? What's really happening? What's the big picture here? And automation, right? How can we automate this process to make it more precise? to make it faster. So uh, I think John mentioned false positives, true positives. Uh, we want to minimize those false positives, right? And maximize the true positives. Every time the bad thing happens, we wanna see it. Now, if we break down that detection function, we dig into that black box that is detection in the SOC. Uh, in this class, we're going to talk about the relationship between false positives and negatives. We'll talk about why you really can't ever get to zero false positives and it's probably not a great goal to shoot for. How we deal with very high volume or low priority alerts. Most of our teams are just awash in signal of all kinds, right? Tons of alerts, tons of noise. How do we dig through that and cut down on that noise quickly, effectively, and in a repeatable way Right, so we can constantly revisit, make sure we're solving this problem on an ongoing basis. We're gonna talk about proactive threat hunting. Of course, it isn't all about responding to alerts, 
right? How do we threat hunt? Uh, additional tools in our toolbox, like deception technology, active defense. Uh, these are other areas of the class that now in the new five-day format, we've been able to spend some time talking about where there really wasn't time in the two-day version of the course, but talking about deception tech, active defense, some of the uh, really cool kind of use cases for that technology. Now, one of the areas um, that has really grown as its own discipline in the SOC over the last several years, of course, is threat hunting. And there's lots of discussion about it. There are lots of different definitions of what it means to threat hunt in the SOC. And one of the common themes of this course, I think for both John and I, is taking things that have frustrated us, uh, lessons we've learned, discussions we've had over and over and over again, and saying, you know what? I wish someone would teach this in a, in a SOC management class, right? I wish this was part of how every uh, manager you know, learned this topic. And threat hunting is one area uh, where we've been able to do that in this class. So we're going to talk about what threat hunting is, what it is not, how you can plan and schedule and execute a threat hunt. We've got a really great lab on how you can do that in a very structured, kind of process-oriented way with very clear, measurable outputs, right? how we can measure the impact of our threat hunting. What are the outcomes of threat hunting? Right. There should be measurable outcomes. We don't want to just do it for threat hunting's sake. So we've taken a lot of our frustrations, a lot of our lessons learned, a lot of our experiences doing threat hunting in operational environments, and we've built it into this course. I'm really excited about uh, all of that content. I also mentioned active defense. Uh, this is another area that is a hot topic for discussion, a lot of disagreement about what it means to deploy active defense, what that looks like if it's really okay to do, if it's legal. Uh, we tackle some of those topics here. Of course, the bottom line with active defense is we want to poison our attackers' OODA loop. We really wanna jam them up and make their lives frustrating and hard, right? So to the extent that uh, they're going to try to observe, orient, decide, act, we wanna feed them information that they can't really rely on. We don't want them to be able to trust their senses. So we're gonna talk about some different technical capabilities that you can deploy. In order to do that, talk about how you can include those technical capabilities uh, in SOC process and workflows, right? We don't want those things just hanging out there in a vacuum. We want them feeding our intelligence process, right? Feeding our detection process. Um, and oh, by the way, it's just kind of fun technology to play around with um, and, and get that unique insight into what attackers may be trying to do in your environment. Now, as I mentioned, we spent an entire day in the new five-day course talking about incident response, starting with building a good IR foundation. What are the plans, the policies, the procedures, step-by-step -step process for how you're going to execute uh, a response? Even if your team isn't wholly responsible for that process, what does that look like? What are the procedures you're going to take uh, that you're gonna follow in order to execute that response? Um, and, you know, that's true whether you're talking about an on-prem environment, whether you're operating in the cloud, whether you're operating in a software development environment, um, right? What are those different instant response use cases look like? And for those investigations, what are some of the tools and techniques that we can use to make sure that our teams are investigating this activity in a consistent and structured way? So we talk about structured analytic techniques. We talk about specific tools, like how to brainstorm hypotheses for investigations, how to use uh, analysis of competing hypotheses, ACH, to make sure that the evidence that you have uh, properly supports right, your conclusions. Um, we also talk about investigation quality control, QC, how to go back and look at your investigations, how to identify evidence of bias, uh, make sure that your analysts, that your team, that your responders are doing things in that structured, repeatable way and avoiding some of the common pitfalls uh, of doing this sort of work day in, day out. But of course, as leaders, as managers, we have to understand that working in a SOC, being an analyst or a responder, right, particularly in instant response, it's not solely a technical process. So... What we've done in this discussion of incident response is we have combined that technical approach with uh, behavioral science, 
We're going to talk a little bit about strategies for collaborative problem solving within your teams, how to make sure that you don't have just one or two key folks driving the entire process, uh, you know, one or two key folks that have all the knowledge, right, that are really driving the team without whom you'd be in real trouble. Now, I'm sure no one on this webcast has a team like that, right? Everybody's team is top notch, everybody at the same skill level, but just imagine if you will, that there are some teams out there uh, that are very heavily reliant on one or a few key rock stars. So we're gonna talk about some ways that you can account for that, that you can raise the collective um, intelligence and capabilities of your team members and not be so heavily reliant on just one or two key individuals. Uh, that's especially true in that instant response process. We're also gonna talk about instant response in the cloud. Or some of the telemetry, some of the control that you have uh, in the containment and eradication phases, for example, is very, very different than what you're going to have on-prem. So we're going to think about commands you want to be able to run, telemetry you need to generate for your team, and artifacts that you want to collect in that investigation and instant response process. We even very briefly get into what that looks like for some of the larger uh, cloud service providers out there with some specific examples. And then we're going to talk about motivating your team. Right? This kind of work uh, is very prone to burnout. Uh, many of us on this webcast have experienced it. I know I have, I'm sure John has uh, in his career. So how do we keep our teams motivated? Remember, this is all about uh, being that operational leader, right? giving your teams autonomy, empowering them, giving them a sense of purpose, right? And those aren't just pretty words that you're going to find in management books, but there are specific things that we talk about in this course that you can do to make sure that your team feels that empowerment, right? To keep them motivated, to um, reduce the likelihood of burnout. We spend some time talking about that. And we also talk about measuring what the SOC is doing. Uh, this is another area where We've really built on quite a bit to the content that was in the two-day version. We've expanded uh, this topic of coming up with metrics, KPIs, OKRs. John wrote a fantastic group of slides and content talking about how these kinds of metrics fit together, how you can develop them for the SOC, how you can execute on using them in an operational environment. One of the most common questions that I always get in classes, in talks, right, consulting on security operations is what are what metrics should I be using? How can I be sure that the SOC is doing what it should be doing? We get into very specific detail uh, in Management 551 about how you develop good metrics and execute on those metrics to demonstrate that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing, performing at the level you're supposed to be performing, and that you're improving over time. But it's not just about executing, we have to be able to tell a good story. This is another one of these areas that as a, an analyst, as a manager, as an executive, uh, I find that is often overlooked in leading operations teams. You have to be able to communicate really well. More than that, you have to be able to tell a good story. Security operations um, is not always top of mind for your executive leadership, for other people in the organization, for users, other teams. I know that may come as a shock to many of you. It was certainly a shock to me at a certain point in my career that everybody didn't care about technical security operations quite as much as I did. So we have to express what the SOC is doing, express our successes, our performance, uh, our objectives, the value we're bringing to the organization, right? We have to express that in a meaningful way. And so we spend some time in class talking about how you can do that, how you can translate the very technical uh, work that the SOC is doing, right, into something that is meaningful to the organization, to your leadership, to other teams, communicating your strategy effectively. Um, you know, we touch on that very important topic. Now, at the top of the webcast, John also mentioned that we want scientific proof that our controls are working, which means uh, we want to assess our capabilities. John spent a few minutes talking about that. So near the end of class, we spend a good deal of time talking about 
different tools, processes, approaches, frameworks for continuously assessing our capabilities. We don't want to just slam a bunch of tools in there, uh, hire a bunch of people, write a bunch of detection uh, rules, and then assume that everything will work fine when an incident happens. That is not the time that we want to discover whether or not our defenses and our detections work. So continuous automated scripted assessment. Um, we spent some time talking about that. We've got some amazing labs where we're actually going to do some purple team assessment, kind of walk through some of those tools. We'll talk about the different kinds of assessments and how they fit together from atomic testing of your individual detections all the way to purple teaming, uh, red teaming, adversary emulation, right? Very realistic, um, kind of complex assessment of all of your capabilities. We'll talk about what that looks like um, and how you can employ that in the SOC, again, to produce that scientific proof that when the bad thing happens, all of those SOC disciplines and that SOC system is going to work as designed. We'll also talk about which kind of testing is more appropriate. Many of you have an existing SOC, maybe relatively mature. Some of you maybe are looking to build out a brand new SOC. And there are different kinds of testing that you wanna do depending on where you are uh, in that maturity spectrum. Uh, purple teaming you know, might not be for everyone. Red teaming, you might not be quite ready for that yet. So we talk about kind of when these sorts of tests make sense, uh, when you wanna use them along that kind of maturity journey. And then finally, uh, we want to talk about how you can optimize the SOC for engagement. So I mentioned uh, optimizing to prevent burnout. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the software that we use, a lot of the processes and things that we have to do in the SOC, right, it's not always fun. It's interesting, uh, but there are some other things that we can do to kind of keep our analysts more engaged. And we can take lessons from uh, gaming, we can take lessons from social media uh, platforms and kind of how those apps are designed, right? And we can kind of take those lessons and build them into some of our SOC tools and processes. We're going to talk about uh, how exactly we can do that. Now, John mentioned the combination of leadership, kind of high-level theory-based exercises and very practical hands-on exercises. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you all that we have assembled perhaps the greatest set of exercises ever seen in an operational leadership course. I'm not going to say that. Um, not going to say that you will not find a more comprehensive set of exercises and tools and frameworks and processes that you can actually take back and use in your environment. Um, but, you know, hey, it's out there, right? And here's a list of uh, some of those exercises that you're going to see in this class, everything from um, how to kind of map out the threats that are out there, likely adversaries uh, that you will you know, very likely see in your environment or see targeting uh, other organizations in your sector, right? And which you should probably plan to try to identify or defend against at some point, how to write playbooks, uh, how to write, um, intelligence requirements so that you can express your needs in very specific terms to whatever your threat intelligence capability is, whether it's another group or a third party or analysts that are embedded in your SOC. Uh, we're gonna talk about SOC capacity planning. John has written a brand new lab, a uh, very, very cool lab that gives you a step-by-step, -step, very specific uh, scientific way of measuring and capturing what the capacity is of your SOC uh, to handle its current workload, future workload. You can express that in very specific terms uh, using the techniques and the tools that we're gonna give you uh, in this lab. We'll talk about planning and executing threat hunts and tabletop exercises, how to use uh, frameworks like the React project to plan your incident response processes and playbooks. We'll talk about designing skills self-assessments and training plans for your analysts, right? how to assemble different types of training and courses and hands-on learning to make sure that your team is empowered, that they have the skills they need. Um, we'll talk about metrics and purple team assessment. As I said, some really great hands-on labs there uh, where we're going to use some tools, some techniques uh, that, that have been proven out in the field and which you can take back to your own teams. And as John mentioned also, 
uh, we have created a brand new version of SANS Cyber 42 leadership simulation just for this class. So we're gonna put you in the driver's seat, uh, leading a security operations team where you're gonna have to make a lot of these different decisions, do a lot of these different things, and then uh, the outcome uh, and your performance in the game will be based on the decisions you make. Um, with that, before we go to questions, I did want to plug John's uh, Blueprint podcast, which just launched uh, season two. Uh, John has some really great conversations with blue team leaders in our field. Definitely urge you to check that out uh, and subscribe if you haven't already done so. With that, uh, I will open it up to questions. Wonderful. Thank you, John and Mark. Uh, we would love people to ask some questions. We just have two right now, so please send some more our way in the Q&A. To get us started, are there video guides for the labs and exercises for the on-demand course? Uh, video guides, like video walkthroughs and all that, I'm going to assume. Um, we haven't made them yet, but we are definitely looking at doing so. The question about some of these is, uh, versus a technical lab where it's very easy to say like, click this thing, enter this command. Uh, some of these are a little bit different. So the answer is not yet, but I hope to get them in there uh, where they can be made in a way that doesn't require like interacting with someone else or something like that. But the class is designed largely for that. So um, we haven't done it yet, but answer is yes, eventually they should be in there. Wonderful. The next question, and if you guys don't know the answers, I do. Uh, is there or will there be a certification for this course? I don't know. It is not <laughs> within uh, the, the SANS instructor's purview to make that happen. However, that being said, the interest of the community in the course is what will drive the creation of the certificate. So if you would like there to be a certificate, uh, the more that GIAC hears from you, the more likely that is to happen, the better the class sells and all that good stuff. Um, I, I would hope the answer to that is yes. Uh, you know, this obviously is a course that has wide applicability to a lot of people in the industry. So while it won't have one from the start, uh, hopefully rather soon after, but that's not up to me, but I'll push as hard as I can. <laughs> Terrific. And that is, oh, we have one more question. Uh, question, is there an upgrade path for those who took the two-day uh, 551 version? I don't yes. have the details on it, but the intent is yes. I don't know, Laura, do you have any? Particular? Yes. So okay. anyone who has answer. already taken the two-day version, if you sign up for the five-day version, you would be credited for the amount that you already paid for the two-day version. And if you have any trouble with that, you can email me directly at ldawson at sans.org. Thank you very much. The course seems loaded, but maybe a bit overwhelming. Is there a more appropriate version for leadership for less mature SOC leaders? We have a lot of SANS management courses. Uh, at the front of the webcast, we had the whole curriculum guide there, and I believe we have it easily found on the SANS Cybersecurity Leadership website. Um, in terms of SOC-specific training, there is not another course for that. But that being said, this is a course designed for people who, I mean, if you're at literally zero, um, you'll do fine in this course. Like you don't need to come in with any tools or anything like that. We will help you build the blueprint for whatever it is that you are trying to create and whatever it is will best serve you as an organization. So don't worry about, uh, there's a lot of people, like I said, when I pulled the class, most people in the course are in the middle of, of building a SOC uh, and usually on the earlier stages. All right. Will you make available newly developed resources to students who previously attended? So the way we do it is we have versions uh, and SANS classes. If you ever have taken one before, we have, you know, numbers and letters that kind of designate it. And yeah, as things get fixed, uh, we will put them into uh, the course for those who have taken that same version. As time goes on though, and the course gets more dramatically changed, if we were to push those, because we can do virtual machine updates remotely is, is I guess the, the mechanism here. Um, we have to cut those off at a certain point because it would break what you have if you didn't have a very specific setup. And so what's going on on the back end of all our virtual machines is a lot of complex kind of Docker Compose stuff going on and, and various things. So to keep things in sync, you will get all the updates for the version that you have. But once we have a major version upgrade, then uh, that is would never, uh, that would be cut off. 
And I would like to add that there are additional free resources. For example, John created a sock poster and that is a free downloadable resource. And over time, authors uh, and instructors do create various cheat sheets and guides and things like that, which are available and made public. What's the, uh, the short URL for that, Laura? Is that sans.org slash free? Uh, I will sans.org slash posters. Oh yeah, for the specific poster. Yes, yes. There, there's that one, mm -hmm. but there's a whole like website full of just tons, yes. and tons of resources for all the SANS courses. Uh, SANS.org.free. Yes. Yeah, and, Flash and free. <laughs> um, as, a, as a side note to that, I am doing a whole bunch of other, like the Blueprint podcast. I got some YouTube channel stuff, Mark's online doing live streams and other things too. So uh, there is a lot of content coming out of us, whether it's under the, the umbrella of the class or not. Uh, we are certainly trying to do a whole bunch of stuff outside of the course too. Definitely. Uh, will this course be available to master's students? I don't think that that is the case just yet. John, do you know? It's brand new. So not yet that I'm aware of, but I have had some discussions on that. Again, that one's kind of a little bit out of my hands, but I'm going to try to make it available for that. Yes, uh, as much as I can. And if, if you are a uh, master's student, you can always request it. And I'm sure that would be one of those things that would go into consideration as well. Perfect. And the final is just a comment. Hey, John, love your content. Would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Yes, please connect to us on LinkedIn. Uh, Mark and I are both available. Uh, Secub is my Twitter username. LinkedIn, you can find me, Mark Orlando on, on LinkedIn. And, and Mark A. Orlando is your Twitter handle? Yep. Yep. Mark A. Orlando. Perfect. Great. We just got one more question. When purchasing, which VAT law should be taken into consideration? And I do not know the answer to that. And I would recommend that you email registration at sans.org. So at this time, uh, we don't have any other questions. This webcast will be available uh, in about 24 hours through your SANS portal with the slides. You can find your CEUs for all completed webcasts by logging into your SANS portal account, navigate to your account dashboard, and then click my webcasts and you can download your CE, CEUs on the right hand side of the web page. Thank you all very much for joining us today and we hope to see you in the class at a future time. Thank you everyone. Thanks everybody.